Thank you, worship team. Can we thank our worship team? These guys are phenomenal. And they will be back. They will be back. Well, my name is Mark. If we have not met, it is so good to be with you today uh, on Mother's Day of all days. Can we one more time just give it up for all the incredible mamas in the house? We love you. We're so grateful for you. You're the reason why we're here. And uh, you're the reason why we survived. And you show us Jesus' grace and his mercy and his warmth. And we're so grateful for each of you. Uh, for, for all the mamas, for all the spiritual mamas, uh, the women, the incredible women who say, you're not my kid, but I'm going to treat you like you are and show you the love of Jesus by taking you under my wing. And so we, we love you. And we're honored that you're a part of our community. So grateful that all of you are here. Uh, if it's your first time, we're so glad that you decided to uh, take some time on a Sunday morning to, to be with us. Could we thank and welcome all of our first-time guests? Could we... We welcome them today. It's amazing. And uh, let's give it up as well for everyone tuning in online and joining us online. We love you. So glad that you're with us. Okay, so uh, my name is Mark, and uh, I am the co-lead pastor here, myself and Roberta. We lead together, and uh, it's an honor, and it is a privilege, and it is the joy of our life to uh, just week after week build towards these moments. This isn't our church, by the way. This is a program of our church. Uh, church is not services or buildings. Church is people. And so we'd love to invite you to be a part of the community, be a part of the people. Growth Track is a great way to do that. Fill out a Connect card. That's a great way to just get plugged in, get connected, be a part of the church, not just show up to a church service. Uh, but of course, we love, we love our church services, but we, just lo- we wouldn't want to do anything else with our lives. And so uh, thank you for taking the time to be here today. And uh, last week, we, uh, we began a brand new collection called Gold from Golgotha. And what we are doing over about nine weeks, because we have some long weekends, as you heard, we take long weekends off uh, in the summer just to rest, just to enjoy God, to go out to the cabin guilt-free, to to just sleep in, to do what what you got to do, what you want to do. And so uh, that's next weekend, and then we got another one in June. So about about nine weeks, uh, minus two Sundays, we will be covering the seven final precious statements that Jesus made while on the cross. While Jesus was on the cross, uh, working his way towards, back towards heaven, he in agony mustered up all the strength, all the ability while hanging on that cross to tell us seven things. So we felt like it was important to just create some space, some margin in our lives, to really lean in, to attempt to understand what Jesus was saying. Words are important. The things that we say are important. The Bible actually teaches that the power of life and death is in the tongue. What you say holds weight. It matters. But what about your final words? A lot of us don't get to choose our final words. Jesus knew the end was near, and these are the final statements that he decided to make. So if you have your Bibles, I would like to invite you to Luke chapter 23. Turn there right now real quick. I'll give you a minute. Luke chapter 23, starting in verse 32. Luke chapter 23, starting in verse 32. If you don't have a Bible, it's cool. It's going to be on the screens. You can follow along there. Uh, If you don't have a Bible, we would love to gift you one. After service, if you go to the Welcome Center, we would give you a Bible for free that you can bring with you next week, and you could uh, follow along and mark it up and highlight it and study it and really begin to understand God's Word. Of course, you can download an app on your phone, on your iPhone, because if you have an Android, you're actually not allowed in the building. (laughs) So we'll just have the ushers escort you out really quickly. Just throw up your hand. No. (laughs) Throw up your hand if you made a bad decision. (laughs) The worst thing ever is when you're like, hey, let's start a group chat, and someone's like, uh, I have an Android. And you're like, dang it, Mark Sinclair. (laughs) This man right here, he's on our board, and he has an Android. And so every board meeting, we we vote on whether to keep him on the board for that reason. (laughs) Kidding. Kidding. 
Oh, Android users. Okay. The eighth statement Jesus made on the cross. Anyways. So, jumping in, starting at verse 32. It says, two others who were criminals were led away, and they were put to death with him. And when they came to the place that is called the skull, which is where we get Golgotha. Golgotha is the, the uh, Greek Aramaic translation of the Hebrew word that, that means the skull. Uh, at the place that is called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. We covered this last week. And they cast lots to divide his garments, and the people stood by watching. But the rulers scoffed at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself, if he is the Christ of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine and and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him, this is the king of the Jews. Now what they would do, what the Romans would do during crucifixion is they would actually uh, inscribe the the crime that the person had committed and actually nail that to the cross so everyone who walked by and saw, because the crosses weren't up high like they're depicted in some paintings, they're actually maybe his feet would be a foot off of the ground and so people could walk by, mock them, spit at them, abuse them, call them names, um, but they would have their crime listed right at the top of the cross. Here, Jesus' crime, his so-called crime is listed. It says, this is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who was hanging, who, who were hanged, railed at him, saying, are you not the Christ? Save yourself, but also save us. But the other rebuked him, saying, do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him in his second statement while on the cross, he said, truly, I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for these few moments that we have together to spend in community, but not just with each other horizontally, but with you vertically. We understand and we acknowledge that this is a moment, a marker, where heaven and earth come together because you are in this room. And you are speaking and ministering to our hearts as we minister to you, as we worship you, as we praise you because you're so good and powerful, wonderful and beautiful, you're speaking back to us. So today I pray that we would be receptive to the word that you wanna speak, to what you want to say to us. We ask that you would do a beautiful, powerful, wonderful work in our hearts today. We know that a message can't change us, or save us, but an encounter with Jesus can, and it will and it does every single time. So we yield to the Holy Spirit, we submit and we surrender our souls, our lives, every area of our existence to you right now. Have your way. We pray this in Jesus' name and all the God's people said, amen, amen, amen. amen. Uh, a couple days ago, I, uh, we were driving, we were on our way home from somewhere, I can't remember exactly where, uh, but we needed to make a little pit stop because we had to pick up some supplies. These days, we find ourselves doing our main grocery shop, and then we got our little bonus grocery shop, and then, oh, we forgot some more stuff, so we have a second or a third grocery shop, and so it's a tension in our marriage. <laughs> We're working through that. Still haven't figured out how to just get the whole list together. So we're driving home, and we need to stop. At, at, you're wondering, whose fault is it? Is it his or hers? You, you use your imagination. <laughs> I didn't imply anything, I just said you decide. On Mother's Day, you gotta say it's my fault, okay? But tomorrow you will know the truth and the truth (laughs) shall set you free. (laughs) So we had to stop at Sobeys and normally when we stop at Sobeys, you know, we go in as a family, but I'm like, I'm just gonna be quick. We had to grab two things. So I I rush in and I leave Roberta and Rome and Hanson in the car. 
I believe I had to pick up some of those little fruit squeezes because our kids love those things. So I got like 10, 15 of those and they're just in my hands. And then I had to pick up a four liter of milk. So I picked up a four liter of milk. And then I had one more stop to make. I had to pick up some ice cream. Had to, I got to, I wanted to. So I had to get some ice cream. Wanted to get some ice cream. And I, am, I turned down an aisle and there was a man standing here looking at the aisle here. So I came from this way, and I'm like, oh, if I'm just going to sneak by you, like how we do as Canadians. Oh, I'm just going to sneak by you. And he stops, or he like backs up. And then as I'm walking by, he looks at me, and he starts a conversation. And the first thing he says, this was his intro. This was our, our first introduction to each other. He said, they're messing with us as Canadians. But he didn't say messing. Use your imagination. <laughs> And I'm like, oh, are they? <laughs> and I'm like, this is about to get real good. So he's like, he's like, come here. Like as though I had, by my, my curiosity showed like, bro, I'm with you. Show me everything you just discovered. I, I'm, I'm, I'm in it. So he's like, come here, come here. And he goes real low like this because it's on the bottom shelf. And he goes, look at this. Cheese whiz. Tiny bottle, $8. I was like, that's outrageous. <laughs> He's like, they're messing with us. This shouldn't be $8. He said, just recently, I bought this same cheese whiz. It was only $5. I said, oh man, yeah, things are wild right now in Canada and, and all over, like, yeah. And I was about to walk away. He's like, come with me. So we're looking at an aisle like this, and I kid you not, he walks me all the way to the next aisle, all the way down over here, and I'm with him. I'm, with, I'm like, we're, we're shopping together now. So he's like, he's like, look at this. And he shows me, um, what's that brand that makes the, the, the chips? Is it uh, Tostitos or something like that? Or you know, who makes the dip? Who makes the dip? Tostitos, they do make the dip. Okay, so he shows me a giant jar of Tostitos queso. And he says, look at this. It's only $5. And it's way bigger. He's like, they're messing with us. He said, this is real cheese. Cheese whiz brings me back. <laughs> and like, I'm not even making any of this up. Brings me back, picks it up. There's not even any real cheese in this. And by the way, if the gentleman who I had this encounter with is here today, I love you. <laughs> so yeah, man, that's, that's crazy. And he's like, yeah, you know, what I'll do is I'll just buy this queso instead of buying cheese whiz. And he's like, I'll just throw it in everything. I throw a teaspoon of it in everything. I just <laughs> trick the kids into thinking they're getting some cheese. He just throws queso into everything. Someone just nodded and they do the same thing. I didn't know that was a thing. Is that a Manitoba thing? Is that a Winnipeg thing to just queso and everything. And I was thinking to myself, like, everything? <laughs> like, like, I get some mac and cheese, you know, but like, like a stir fry, just queso, so. <laughs> Anyways, I, I have this moment with him, and, and I'm, my hands are full this whole time, by the way, and I rushed to get ice cream, and, and I had a smile on my face. Like, I was beaming the whole, like, rest of my time. I paid, and I was so nice. I was smiling. I get back to the car. I'm walking. I see Roberta look at me, and I'm just smiling. I'm beaming. She's like, why are you so happy? She says, wait, wait, wait. First of all, what took so long? You were supposed to be just a couple of minutes. I was like, babe, you're never going to believe what just happened. I just had the best interaction of my life. But it's interesting because that story points out, that moment points out a skepticism that I think exists in all of us. We hear something. We see something. And we're like, they're messing with us. This can't be the truth. This can't be the fact. This can't be legit. There's got to be something else going on. I think the last few years, we've just kind of learned to kind of hear information and then sneer our heads at it. I'm so grateful for the Bible, and I'm so grateful for today's scripture, because Jesus is like, I'm just going to give it to you straight. I'm not going to mess around with you. I'm not going to, you know, cloud it. I'm not going to shroud it. I'm just going to tell it to you straight. So you don't have to approach this text with any cynicism or skepticism or wondering, does he really mean what he really means? He says this statement. He says, truly, I say to you, 
What is he saying? He's saying, I'm not messing with you. I'm just telling you the truth. Jesus actually uses this specific, uh, specific statement 76 times in the New Testament. And it's pretty much exclusively reserved for Jesus. Other authors, other people in the New Testament do not use this. Truly, I say to you, Jesus is like, this is mine. And I'm going to use this when I want them to follow me. And I'm just going to give it to them straight. Saying, you don't, you don't got to wonder. You don't got to be curious. You don't, gotta, you don't got to question. What I'm about to say, number one, listen up. And by the way, everything that Jesus says while hanging on the cross is an invitation. Listen up. We covered this last week about how he would be in great pain and agony every single time he spoke because the cross did not kill you by blood loss or just letting you, you, you know, bleed out or it wasn't the nails. It, it, it was suffocation. And so the, the weight of his body pulling him down, the only way for him to breathe was to lift himself up. And of course, in order to speak, it is air passing through your diaphragm or something like that. I'm sure Christy knows the science behind how words work. I don't, but I do know air is involved. So if he wanted to speak, <laughs> I'm a preacher. I know the Bible and basically nothing else, okay? So he has to lift himself up so he could breathe and so he could speak. Of course, his back was raw and whipped and bloodied and the cross was rugged and harsh. And so even that action alone, let alone putting the weight, all his weight on the nails in his feet, lifting up his hands, just so he could say these words. So already it's like, yo, listen up. These final words I'm about to say, these are really, really important. But then he says, truly I say to you. So it's like, listen up. Today, you will be with me in Paradise, there's two criminals hanging on the cross and he speaks this to the second one. Here's what I wanna do. I just wanna pull a few truths from this text. There's a lot here. I wanna just give you five truths, five thoughts from this text. I would invite you, encourage you to write these down. Things that we can learn from this moment where Jesus makes his second of seven final statements on the cross. The first thought is this, God isn't afraid of your mess. God isn't afraid of your mess. Our God is a God who gets in the mud. He gets in the mess. He gets in the dirt. And I don't know if you are aware of this or not, but you are a disaster. You are messy. You are covered in mud. And by the way, so am I. We are flawed broken people. We got issues. We got pain. We got problems. We got things in the way, get, that get in the way of our relationship with God, relationship with each other. Uh, even as we mature as followers of Jesus, we're always working on something. We're disasters. We got problems. We got issues. Uh, Paul writes, uh, I believe it's in Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. He says, this statement is fully worthy, uh, this fully trustworthy. What I'm about to say, you can trust. Uh, we're sinners. And Jesus came to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. And so the goal or the revelation of Christianity is not they're bad, they're bad, they're bad. It's like, whoa, I'm bad. I'm a disaster. I'm a mess. I got hangups and hurts and aches and issues. Jesus, in his final moments on earth, this moment we have to understand has been divinely ordained. This whole thing has been orchestrated. Nothing that happens here is happening by accident. And so it was not just convenient for the Romans to all of a sudden crucify two criminals next to Jesus on the same day. That was supposed to happen. Jesus wanted us to see him in the company of two criminals. He wanted us to read thousands of years later and see that he is not afraid of the mess and the darkness and the issues that people carry with them. Yeah. And it's important to note that crucifixion was reserved for the most heinous and vile of crimes. So the Bible refers to them as criminals. Elsewhere we see them referred to as thieves, but they weren't just criminals and they weren't just thieves. They were violent, vile criminals and thieves. 
What they did was worthy that the Romans decided they're so bad, we're going to make an example of them. We're going to have them crucified. So these aren't just two dudes who got caught up in something and now they're being crucified next to Jesus. No, these are bad, bad, bad men. And Jesus decides, I'm going to be crucified next to them. Why? To show us, hey, I'm not afraid to get in the darkness with you. I'm not afraid. I'm not avoiding your issues. I'm not running around in heaven yelling, code red, code red. Dad, look, I I died on the cross for them. And look what they just... That's not, that's not our Jesus. He can face it. He can handle it. He, he, he hates sin, no mistake, but he loves you and I. And so he looks past that. He moves past it to get into the place where we are. Jesus runs towards the mess. Jesus runs towards the hurting. We as human beings, we usually like to run away from it. But Jesus runs towards it. Jesus saw the mess happening on earth, and what did he do? He said, I'm getting off my heavenly throne, and I'm going to come put on human flesh. I'm going to be a baby. I'm going to grow up. I'm going to live a sinless, perfect life, and ultimately, I'm going to die for these people. He runs towards the mess. He goes through great lengths, puts himself at a massive inconvenience to come and show up in your life and in mine. He's not afraid of the mess. But yet, we spend so much of our lives, so much of our time figuring out, how do I cover up my mess? Because we're walking around and we, we, we are these criminals and we've rebelled against God and we've turned our backs to God and we said, I don't want anything to do with you. My will, not your will be done. So we're like, how can I pretend like everything is good? We work so hard to mask up. And even with God, for sure with each other, but even with God. And here he's like, hey, I can handle it. In fact, the very reason why I came to this earth, the very reason why I'm here is to deal with that darkness, to deal with those crimes, to deal with that pain, to deal with those issues, to deal with those hangouts. That's why I came. I'm on this cross for that very reason. So Jesus cannot heal who you pretend to be. And one of my main aims of leading a faith community is to get us to a place where we feel comfortable being uncomfortable where someone says to us how's your day and you aren't lying and like oh I'm good you're like actually I'm not good and that our community would respond in such a way that it's like hey I know it's service and service is happening in five minutes we don't really have time to talk but how about we go get lunch this week and we hear about what's going on in your life that we're, break, we're taking the mask down, we're getting real, we're getting vulnerable. In that space, in the context of real, authentic community, is where we find freedom. And that's ultimately what Jesus wants us to be, is free. He does not want us bound, chained, and shackled. He wants us to be free. So Jesus is like, stop hiding the mess. Stop pretending like you're not as bad as you actually are. The church is the place where we should show up limping. Like, I get it. You want to go to work and you want to show up in other spaces and act like you got it together. But this is a place where you can come and you're like, I actually don't. I know I got the microphone and I'm the pastor, but listen, I'll be the first to admit I don't have it together in the slightest. God's working on me. He's transforming me. I hope I get a little bit better every single day and become more like Jesus every single day. But I'm a disaster. I am a mess. And Jesus is like, listen, look at, the, look at who's on my left and look at who's on my right. I can handle your stuff. I can handle your stuff. And I love this moment too because it also shows us this, that there is no one who is beyond the reach of Jesus' grace. Oh, we love to write others off though, don't we? We love, let's just be honest, we love to draw lines where people cannot cross over like God is pretty gracious he's pretty forgiving but but there's a line there's a line and we write each other off and of course we write ourselves off and we're like yeah I understand God forgave me for this but I don't really think he could forgive me for this and there are people in this room today right now people watching online right now who think that the sin that you're currently battling because you've been battling it for so long that the grace of Jesus is beyond you that the blood of Jesus covers 
most of you, not all of you. But we see in this moment that Jesus' blood that was shed on this cross covers you entirely. And there is no one who is off limits. There is no one who this, this does not apply to. The Bible says that whoever believes in their heart that Jesus rose from the dead and whoever confesses with their mouth will be saved. That's it. That's it. That's it. Confess and believe and you're covered. There is no one beyond. And that messes with our theology, doesn't it? Like we kind of get it. We kind of understand it. But we all got that line. And what I want God to do in our hearts right now is just destroy that line. Because some of you think the political party that you don't agree with can't be a follower of Jesus. That person who has a different opinion, that person who has that past, you, you hold their humanity hostage and you don't allow the grace of Jesus to cover them. Yeah. Some of you have made decisions in your past like 10, 15, 20 years ago that you still wake up in cold sweats in the middle of the night because you think that the blood of Jesus does not cover it. And today, I believe the Lord is saying, be free and set them free. My grace, there is no one who is outside or beyond the reach of Jesus' grace. The cross, even the symbol of the cross is an image of what this is doing. His arms are like this. It's an embrace. It's an invitation. I welcome all. I welcome everyone. And then, of course, the grace of Jesus begins to change us slowly and surely. It does. But it's a process, isn't it? But there is nothing. There is no one. There is nothing. There is no one. There is nothing. There is no one beyond. We can't get away from it. We can't get away from his grace. It covers everyone. It covers all things. Uh, he says this, he says, truly I say to you, today, meaning literally today, you will be with me in paradise. Here's the third thought I had from this text, is that paradise isn't a place, it's a person. Paradise is not a place, it's a person. I'm so pumped about the paradise part of this. What do you think when you think paradise? Paradise. Oh my goodness, beach and water and sun and beautiful smells and food and loved ones. That's paradise. But the most important part of the second final statement Jesus makes while on the cross is not in paradise, it's with me. The focus and the emphasis is not meant to be on the place, paradise, what Jesus is saying is that paradise is not a place. Paradise is a person. Paradise is being with me. Yeah. If you are with Christ, you are in paradise. And I love this text because it doesn't just have implications for the next life, for when we pass and we graduate and we go to heaven. It actually has implications for us in this life because if heaven isn't just a place, heaven is a person, well, Jesus is in this room and Jesus is in me, so I get to experience heaven now. Right. Not fully, not entirely, not perfectly. That will come. But if I have Jesus and I am with Jesus, then I am experiencing heaven. Heaven is the conscious fellowship with Christ after death. Write that down. Heaven is the conscious fellowship with Christ after death. It is not a place that you saw depicted in a movie, all dogs go to heaven, you know, whatever other movie with heaven where it's just clouds and little babies and cupids and you got wings and you're flying around and you play harps. I don't know physically what it's going to be like, we got some inclination that it's going to look like a city, a new, new Jerusalem. We don't know, and it doesn't matter. It's a majestic, beautiful, glorious place. Why? Because, because God is there, yeah. Yeah. and we're with him, and there's no walls. There's no blockers. There's no rebellion. There's no issues. He wipes away every tear. He takes away all of our pain, all of our sorrow. It's all removed, and it's just us and God, yeah. just us with Christ. That's paradise, man. That's paradise. 
So yeah, I'm, so, I'm looking forward to being in paradise in the next life. The Bible says that to live is Christ and to die is gain. I'm gonna gain a whole lot when I die and I go to heaven. But I also get to experience that right here and right now. And I just feel like it's important to mention this as well. If heaven is conscious, eternal fellowship with Christ, then hell isn't what we see in movies either with flames and you know, just putting too many donuts in Homer Simpson's mouth. That was actually a good reference, but you missed it, okay? (laughs) It's eternal conscious separation from Christ. Because everything good is Christ. Everything that you've got in your life that's good and wonderful that you want to hang on to is Christ. He gave it to you. And it actually is meant to be a reflection of him. When you're enjoying, you know, being on the boat, you're enjoying that vacation, you're enjoying watching the game with your loved ones, that's all meant to be like, this is what it's like to be with Jesus. So paradise is not a place, it's a person. The next thought is this, there is nothing we can do to earn heaven. And if I could get Matt, beautiful, good guy Matt, up on the keys as we begin to close out this message. That would be awesome. There is nothing you can do. There is nothing I can do to earn heaven. There are a lot of religions that try to tell us, hey, you gotta earn it. If you're just good, if you, if you just do the right things, then as long as the scale tips and good is heavier than bad, you're, you're, you're gonna be in heaven. Jesus in the Bible completely removed that because the first criminal is mocking Jesus and yelling at him. And the second one, we see this different spirit, this different posture. And Jesus says, today you will be with me in paradise. And so what happens in the church as we follow Jesus is we begin to equate the things that we do with our relationship with God. And so our relationship with God becomes Sunday attendance. Our relationship with God becomes connect group attendance. Our relationship with God becomes Bible reading. Our relationship with God becomes, you know, listening to that sermon, that podcast. All of the things that we do, that's what we equate with, well, being a Christian. This is what it looks like and what it means to be a follower of God. But this criminal who is on the cross next to Jesus, when he passed away and he got to the pearly gates and they say to him, so what'd you do? What kind of impact did you have? What kind of legacy did you leave? How many people did you win to the Lord? How many scriptures have you memorized? How many times have you participated in serve day? What team did you serve on? What teams did you serve on? How much did you give? He's like, he's like, man, I got zero, (laughs) nothing, haven't done that, didn't know that was a thing, nope. And it really messes with our theology of what it means to be a follower of Jesus because we think it's doing all of those things. Now, here's what I want to say because some of us are thinking, I'm off the hook. I can quit my team and I don't have to give anymore. No. But the difference is those things aren't our relationship with Jesus, but they fuel our relationship with Jesus. And they get us in environments and they move our heart to different postures and spaces where we grow in the Lord. And it's not just sanctification. It would, so there's salvation, you're saved. You confess with your mouth, you believe in that Jesus rose from the dead, you're saved. Okay, but then there's sanctification or transformation, which is becoming more like Jesus. And a lot of us are working really, really hard to become more like Jesus, which I think is good and noble, but we're kind of missing the point. So we do want to become more like Jesus. But what we actually want, the reason why we read our Bible, the reason why we come to church on Sunday, the reason why we make the effort to be here as much as possible, the reason why we give, the reason why we sow, the reason why we serve is actually to learn more about Christ and to be drawn into further relationship with him. So I do all of those things, not just because I wanna look like him, which is amazing and that will happen over time. It's because I want to be with him. That is the point of our walk with God. You were separated from Jesus. You gave your life to him through faith. So I'm gonna follow him. I'm gonna dedicate and devote my life to him. And now you're in Christ. And the point isn't to do all the Christian churchy things. The point is to be with him. Now, how do I help myself be with him? It's by doing all of those things. The point I'm trying to make and the point I believe that Jesus is trying to show that the scriptures are trying to show is you can't earn heaven. You can't earn it. You can't be good enough. The Bible says that it is a gift. 
By grace you are saved through faith. It is a gift from God so that no one may boast. We're just not that great. But Jesus has given us this gift. Hey, you can't earn it, but you know what you can do? You can receive it. You can receive it. And today, uh, in a few moments, I'll give you the opportunity to receive this free gift of salvation. The aim of our life is not to do all the right things, to have our ducks in a row, to have it all figured out, to look as Christian as possible. The aim of our life is to spend as much time with Jesus as possible, to do as many godly things as we can because that's going to bring us into the presence of Jesus. Please don't come here to feel good about yourself, to check off a box. Show up here on Sunday, wake up early so that you can encounter the the amazing presence of Jesus. And yeah, you're gonna, he's gonna make you look like him. How could you not? You are the sum of the five people you spend the most amount of time with. May Jesus be one of those people and as you spend time with him, you just begin to look like him. If we could just decide to look like Jesus and be like Jesus, we kinda just wouldn't need Jesus, would we? So this is not a willpower game. This is not a determination game. This is not a let me plan out my day really well and block off time and, and structure my life in such a way that I can look like Jesus knows. I'm just gonna show up, spend as much time as I possibly can with Jesus. That's the invitation. And here's the final thought for today. The cross demands a response. The cross demands a response. You can't earn it. The man did nothing on that cross to earn it. He had no portfolio, no reputation, no one knew his name. He wasn't great in the kingdom of God. But he responded when confronted with the cross of Christ. I thought about calling this point, the cross invites a response or something still pretty like stern but a little less abrasive. The cross requires a response but it does demand, it does demand that when you and I come face to face with Jesus hanging on that cross, we have to choose. I wonder if you've recognized already that you and I are one of those people on the cross beside Jesus. We are those criminals, we are. We've rejected God, we've re rebelled against God, we've turned our own way, we are on and we are worthy of the crucifixion. We are worthy of what Jesus went through. Of course, he took our place so we wouldn't have to, but these two men on the cross beside Jesus show us where we could have been if not for the grace of God. In the first, he joins in with the crowd. He mocks and he scolds and he slanders. He makes fun of Jesus. Hey, you said you're the Christ, you said you're God. Why don't you get us off of here? Which is what they were screaming at him from the ground. Get yourself down if you're so powerful, if your name's so wonderful, if your name's so beautiful, if you're everything that you say you are, we'll just get down off of the cross. So he joins in the mocking, in the demeaning, in the rejection of God yet again. But the second criminal, the one on the other side, you see it in the words that he says, that he's repentant, that he's turning away, that he recognizes this is not a mere man on this cross beside me. This is an innocent person. This is a pure person. In fact, this isn't just a person. This is fully God and fully man. This is the Christ. This is the Messiah. He's different. He's special. And you see him turn. He repents and he asks him, would you, would you welcome me into your kingdom? Which is the salvation prayer. I surrender my man up until now, I've been missing it. But maybe in the final few moments of my life, I could get something right. And Jesus says to him, today, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. We have to choose. And the Bible says to pick up your cross daily and follow me. So yes, there is that marker moment of I am deciding to follow Jesus, but then there is the daily, hourly, minute by minute, moment by moment, choosing to follow Jesus, choosing to turn, choosing to repent, choosing to cast aside our old ways, our old life.
and follow Jesus, to be with him, to recognize I'm not that great, I'm not that special, I can't climb some ladder to heaven. All I could do is let go and Jesus can carry me. So I know many of it in this room, you've already decided, you've already chosen. I, I'm that second man. I see that cross and I'm choosing to follow him. I'm, turn, I'm not turning back. I'm going all in. It's just Jesus. It's just Jesus. It's just Jesus. But some of you, you are here today and maybe you've been coming for a minute. Maybe a friend brought you today. Maybe it's your first time. The whole church thing is new to you. I want to give you that opportunity to make a decision, to choose to do something with what you're seeing. Because you cannot just see the bloody Jesus on the cross and choose to walk away. And one of the things I feel like is really important today is to address the fact that sometimes we do mask up and sometimes we do pretend. And some of you are here and you're a Christian but you have forgotten what it means to be with Christ because you have turned following Jesus into going to church and being churchy enough and just getting by. You know, just not sharing everything, but sharing enough so they think you're real, they think you're authentic, you're not drawing a reaction. And the reason why I think this is important to address is because inside you're suffering and inside you're dying because you're doing all the right things, you're trying to earn your way into heaven, you're trying to fit into the church, but you're not with Christ, and Christ is paradise. So there's an invitation today to see that cross yet again, to hear what Jesus is saying, today, 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 and every day, until eternity, and then for all of eternity, you will be with me in paradise.